Well, I'm going to, um, before I start ministering here, I actually wanted to take a minute just to go over a couple things last night. How many of you were at Night of Prayer? We had quite a group. Weren't you blessed? Um, I just wanted to go over a couple things and really just um, was so stirred. And how many of you know there is promises that God has promised you? And we're going to talk tonight about faith that doesn't quit. But there is promises, there are promises to you. And what does the Bible tell us? Those promises are what? They're yes and amen. So God's already given us those promises. Our response is yes and amen. In other words, so be it. And I was just so uh, stirred up last night as Pastor Nate was sharing and he shared a word of the Lord through Brother Mark that was to our body back in July of um, 2017. And how many of you know those words, words that the Lord gives you never expire? Aren't you thankful that words of the Lord, you know, sometimes because of time when in this life we can look and go, oh, well, that was five years ago and I still, you know, haven't seen what I thought I'd see or I don't know if that could still be valid for today. It's as great and alive and as it ever will be because his promises never expire. They never go out. What does it tell us? That his word is alive, it's active, it's powerful. That means every time we put our eyes or our ears or our mouths to his word, it's just as active and just as powerful. So um, just a few things that he talked about and really what I wrote down and what really spoke to me is, um, and we just kind of talked about fighting and fighting the good fight of faith. And I know in the devotional that we sent out today with the little text, it just said, get back up, something like that. Get back up in your faith. And how many of you know there's times where it takes us saying, get back up. And I believe this is a time right now where the Lord is saying, get back up get back up. It's time to fight. You're in a fight and it's time to get back up. And what do we know that we don't, we don't fight naturally. We fight spiritually. What does it say that the weapons of our warfare aren't carnal? It's spiritual, but he's given us every weapon that we need to fight and to fight successfully. And so one of the things that the Lord just really spoke to me last night, um, and Pastor Nate actually said, was there's a, it's a different note in the fight. And I love that because it's a note of, a note of victory is a note of joy. You know you're in faith when, when you're full of joy and you're full of hope. If you're walking around depressed and sad, you're not in faith. So it's very easy to tell and to self-identify, am I in faith? Because if I'm in faith, I have a picture of hope. There's joy. My countenance is different. I'm not dragging along. Right? So I just believe there's just a different note, a different note for each and every one in this body, that we're back up in our faith. We're believing God for things as individually and corporately. And um, just a few of the things that um, Brother Mark said in this um, prophecy that Pastor Nate played was this would be a place of launching. Launched into preaching and teaching the gospel or the good news. And that this would be a sign and a wonder of the presence of God. Every meeting will be a place of the presence of God. Guys, we got to be believing this. Every place, every time we come together, every meeting is going to be a place of the presence of God. And um, the word growing and multiplying. Aren't you thankful? Rivers flowing out and many shall drink. This to me speaks of it's not just a river from the pulpit. It's out of your belly. Out of your belly will flow rivers that many can drink from. From this pulpit, yes, but you're, you're the body. So out of your belly are going to flow rivers that refresh others, that bring life to others. Um, 
And then just this, and I loved this, um, talked about praying in the spirit more than we've ever prayed before. Talks about um, confessing that you receive the anointing to do everything that he's called you to do. Um, we're a spirit-filled church. Thank you, Lord. We're word and spirit. Y'all are going to have to respond. And we're going we're gonna to teach on this a little bit and become better responders. Because how many of you know responding is a good thing? If Jesus showed up in the room, guarantee you'd respond. Faith responds. Faith responds. So we're a spirit-filled church. Pastor Nate said this, we're a responding church, which means when the word comes and you receive something, you respond. I'll tell you this. If I didn't realize, honestly, how much responding in the room helps the anointing until I got up here and started teaching. If you've ever been on the platform, you understand that when when people are responding, and I'm not talking about doing it not out of faith and fake. We don't, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a genuine expectation and a genuine response because you're responding to what the Holy Spirit is saying. When there is that, I, I mean, I've had it before where one person responds out loud and you can feel the increase of the anointing. Simply because they're responding not to be seen, not to be heard. It's a response of faith. And when one person's response of faith happens, the anointing increases. And so I just want to encourage you, whatever it is, when, when, you, when the Holy Spirit is giving you something or instructing you in some way, respond. And I'm not just saying shouting. I'm, not, I'm just saying in general. When he instructs you to do something, it could be in worship. We just had a testimony um, uh, in pre-service meeting on Sunday where um, the worship team was up here and a few of us uh, knelt down during a time of worship. And an usher in the back felt a tap on the shoulder and looked over and didn't see like looked over to see who that was, and he said it, it wasn't anyone, but he had a sense that it was like Jesus was walking up the aisle. Well, what was that from? Responding. Responding. So response, and you see that in, in um, the Gospels with Jesus. We talked about this a little bit on Sunday morning, but there was a response from people. He had them respond somehow. What did it say? Go wash in the pool of Siloam. Pick up your mat. I mean, there, there was responding. It, was, it didn't just, we can't just expect stuff to fall on us. There's always a response of faith. So I want to encourage you, if you leave not having anything, look at what your response and where your faith was at. Because if it was just coming to sit or just coming to hopefully God shows up and hopefully I get what I need, there's no response of faith there. God always calls us to respond in faith. And so I just wanted to encourage you on that, and I'm sure we'll um, talk more on that. That is not my message. But, okay, and I'm believing to get through all this. If not, we'll just have to do part two, you know, next time. All right. So we are going to talk tonight on faith that doesn't quit. And um, I wanted to just read this verse before we get into this, Romans 1.16. And you may not have it. I added it in during worship. But it says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. So what do we see here? We're not to be ashamed of the gospel. And this is something that the Lord's really been stirring in me, that we're... When I say we, not just me, all of us, we're going to have to not be ashamed of the gospel, of, of the word, of truth, of what this gospel is. And let me say it again, it's good news. So anything that is said that this is gospel and it's fear and it's doom and gloom and it, that's not good news. 
I am not ashamed of the gospel. So we, as a congregation, we're going to have to be bold to preach the gospel and not back down from it. Because culture is going the way to try to get you to back down and to be afraid. To be afraid to speak the gospel. To be afraid of what someone might think. But what does this say? For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God unto salvation. This is how we're born again. This is how salvation comes. is through unashamedly preaching the good news of the gospel. So we will be a house who unashamedly preaches the gospel. You will be a people. We will be a people who unashamedly preaches the good news of the gospel. Okay. Um, Okay. So how many of you know we've, we've said this before, but faith is not based on reasoning. Remember, we're responding tonight. Faith is not based on reasoning. Faith is of the heart. Faith is a choice. If it's to the satisfaction of your reasoning, your what you're looking at physically, what you've examined, what you've tried to figure out, there is no faith involved. Faith is involved when you just say, God, if you said it, I believe it. That's it. If God said it, then I believe it. That's faith. Faith doesn't try to get all the answers before to believe. I think of this, have you, um, have you ever heard, like, I think nowadays they probably teach you, like, don't just tell your children because I said so. You need to explain it to them, and you need to give them a reason. And I'm not saying there's times for that, okay? But I am saying, if we in culture, again, this is, this is why we have to be in the Word. Because culture will try to tell you what is right and accurate. But God's Word is what is right and accurate, And if I am training my children, if I am training myself with authority, let's just talk authority, not even just kids with parents. Let's just talk us with a boss or us with a spiritual leader or us with whatever. And we always have to have a reason before we decide to agree with it or to obey it. There is a huge problem. Because this is not how the kingdom of God operates. In order for me to believe and in order for me to trust and in order for me to step out in faith in what God has said, I don't always have to understand and I don't always have to have a reason. And you know what? Sometimes he will give you it. But there's a lot of times he's just going to ask you to do it because he just asked you to do it. And that has to be enough. Sometimes mom and dad tell you to do something, and sometimes they don't have to explain it to you. Sometimes your boss asks you to do something, and he shouldn't have to explain it for you, for you and your 20 coworkers to not bicker and complain and gripe. Simply because the authority that God put over me asked me to do this, therefore, even when I don't understand, even when I don't agree, I'm going to come under that authority. Because how many of you know there's more authority than just God? That God's placed. All authority has been given by God. And we as Christians are to be an example. And if, if we can't do it with physical authority here, we will not do it with God. So you can probably guarantee, if you are constantly questioning authority, you are constantly questioning God. If you constantly have to have a reason to obey spiritual authority or physical authority over you, you are always questioning God. And God is not always going to give you a reason. Because then what? You wouldn't have to have faith. 
And then based off of what I assess and what is told to me is whether or not I'm going to choose to agree with it. So what do we see? That we are to operate by faith. So this is how God operates. And this is how your whole life with him operates. Because he said so. Because God said so. Well, why do I need to do this? Because God said so. Well, why do I need to believe this? Because God said so. That's it. Because God said so. This is where faith is at. Because he said so, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to believe it. Hebrews 10.38 tells us this, Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. So how are we to live? By faith. Not by reason, not by because I agree and understand everything that's going on. Because let's also just put this into perspective. Man always wants to think that they know. I just told Pastor Nate this this morning. I was reading, I don't even know how I got there. I was reading in Isaiah this morning. And I'm like, you know, sometimes the Old Testament is really good because it puts into perspective how big God is and how really small we are. Like in a day and age where man is exalted in their knowledge and how much we know and how much we can figure out, and how much AI provides us, is nothing, nothing compared to God. I mean, it was talking about how he had bees and flies hit up in the mountain, and with like this, he could release them. I'm just saying like the breath of his nostril, like we have to put into perspective really who we're Fear of the Lord. That any time I think I've figured out, men have been trying to figure stuff out for a long time. And we just have to know there's a lot we don't know. And that's okay. Because I don't have to know everything to believe and to walk by faith. Okay, so we see, and if you look at the book of Hebrews, the whole context of the book of Hebrews was really a group group of people who took a strong stand in Christianity, but only later because of persecution backed off. They backed off of their faith and they backed off of their stand. And so what do we know? We have to be encouraged to not quit. Faith that does not quit. It doesn't back down when it's persecuted. And sometimes we think of persecuted. Sometimes the persecution comes just with thoughts. Persecution of your faith can come in the form of bombardment of thoughts that are not what God says. And it can also come persecution through just what others or people might say. But we cannot back off. So let's look at Numbers 14, 24. And I love this. This says, but my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land where he went and his descendant shall inherit it. So what do we see? Caleb was what? He had a different spirit. Do you know you and I are to have a different spirit? We're to have a different spirit, a spirit of faith, a a spirit of ones who don't have to know everything. We just simply take God because he said so. This is what was a different spirit about Caleb, because God said this, because God said so. Joshua and Caleb just said, God said, God said, God said. They didn't go back and work together and say, okay, guys, so we got to figure this out. There is giants, there is, but, but we, we can ask God all these questions and we can figure out how to make it happen. No, what did they just say? This land is ours, we'll take it. So we're going to look at this whole passage, okay? Numbers 13, we'll start in verse 17. It says, Then Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, 
Go up this way into the south and go up to the mountains and see what the land is like. Whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, few or many. Whether the land they dwell in is good or bad. Whether the cities they inhabit are like camps or strongholds. Whether the land is rich or poor. And whether there are forests there or not. Be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin as far as Rehob, near the entrance of Hamath. And they went up through the south and came to Hebron, okay, all these places. The descendants of Anak were there. Then they came to the valley of Eshkol, and there cut down a branch with one cluster of grapes. They carried it between two of them on a pole. They also brought some of the pomegranates and figs. The place was called the valley of Eshkol because of the cluster which the men of Israel cut down there, and they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told him and said, we went to the land to where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak, in other words, giants. Big people, which they say were probably 10 to 11 or more feet tall. Huge armor that one man could bear, like a normal man could barely, barely carry. So what do we see? These, this, isn't, this is real giants. And in their head, they're really looking and going, it wasn't like, hey, let's, let's aim this tank over there and just knock them out. This was like hand-to-hand fighting combat. Um, the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, the Hittites, Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb, remember, who is this one? Of a different, quieted the people. Sometimes you have to quiet yourself and you have to quiet people. Before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a what? Of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, If we had only died in the land of Egypt, or if we had only died in this wilderness... Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let us select a leader and return to Egypt. This story is just getting better. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. But... Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them. And the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meeting before all the children of Israel. So, what do we see here? When the spies, there was 12 spies. So, 10 of them came back with a different report. Two of them came back with another report, Joshua and Caleb. So when the spies saw the giants, the ten spies, what happened? Fear got on them. And like we said, because of what they what? Saw. 
So, like we talked about, we can see why they would be intimidated, right? Big walled cities, huge, huge giants there. Weapons, armor, all of that. So what they saw caused them to fear. And it caused them to turn loose any faith that they had and to draw back. But Caleb and Joshua saw the exact same thing and yet had a completely different perspective. They are bread for us is what they said. So modern translation, we can eat them. It's like bread, like nothing. Or piece of cake. We got this. Because what did he say? Their protection has departed them. Because how did he know? They weren't looking at Joshua and Caleb. They were looking knowing we got God. And because we have God, that's bread. They have no protection, even though they saw the same thing. So how do you go from no way? the, The other spies were saying there's no way. Not only no way, then they started like, making up stuff that wasn't even there. (laughs) Like, we're like grasshoppers, and they're this, and they're that. But others said, piece of cake, we got it, we can take it. It makes all the difference what you're looking at. So, faith, Joshua and Caleb said, they looked at God and who was with them and who was for them. And they said, God is with us. We can do it. We are well able. So is our report no way not going to happen when we're facing a hard situation or something in life that we're standing in faith for? Or is our declaration we're well able? So the principles of faith are identical today. You may not be facing a huge giant with big armor, but it may be something large like debt, big debt, or sickness in your body or a loved one's body or relationships, whatever it might be that you're facing, the enemy comes to say there's no way. There's no way. Maybe you got a report and and the enemy just keeps feeding there's no way. And the more you keep looking at your symptoms at the problem, it becomes even bigger than it actually is. That's what we see here. It started to, like, be magnified and dramatized. But what did they say? With God, all things are possible. They were completely convinced that it was impossible to conquer these giants and walled walled cities. But just a generation later, under Joshua, they proved it was possible. Did you know the story doesn't stop here? It took a little bit because they had to get rid of the unbelief in the camp. And all those men passed away. But what do we know? They did it. So nothing is too big. The giant was not the problem. The giants, the walled cities, the armor was not the problem. Fear and unbelief is what was the problem. Your symptoms, what your, the, the reports, the things that you're going against is not the problem. The problem is fear if he can get us into fear and unbelief. So like we talked about earlier, fear is not hard to discern. We've all been there. People who are full of fear are sad. They're depressed. They're panicked. They're hopeless. But on the contrary, faith is not hard to discern. So do you think if God dropped you, just say, God dropped you into the camp where Joshua and Caleb, Moses, all the Israelites are, do you think you'd be able to pick out without knowing who they were, Joshua and Caleb? They wouldn't be grumbling and complaining. They wouldn't be stressed out. They wouldn't be hopeless. They wouldn't be on the ground crying in a fetal position. They'd be like walking around like, guys, we got this. Joy. Joy. 
If you are convinced that what you're facing is an impossible, unfixable situation, then you are stuck. For you, it is impossible. But with God, it's not. Nothing is too big for our God. We cannot be discouraged. We cannot be depressed. Nothing is too big. So we can enter into rest. You can enter into rest. There is a faith rest. Okay, let's look at um, this, Numbers 14, 20 through 24. It says, Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word, but truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have put me to the test now these ten times and have not heeded my voice, they certainly shall not see the land which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. But... My servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land where he went and his descendants shall inherit it. So there was a different spirit. There was a different spirit that Caleb carried, which was different than fear and rebellion, which is really where the children of Israel were in. It wasn't just fear. It was in rebellion to what God had said. So God said, I've given you the land. Go up and possess it. I am with you. And what did they say? I know he said that, but we've seen the giants, so we can't. How many times do we do this with stuff we're facing? I know what he said. I know what God's promised me. I I see the promises, but I just don't see how it can happen. It's just too far. There's just no way. He just can't. And there is sometimes where ignorance, we are not believing just due to ignorance, not knowing. But the children of Israel and the spies was not because of ignorance. They knew what God said. It was stubbornness, and it just boiled down to saying, it wasn't I can't, it was I won't. Because of the 12 spies, two said they could. So it wasn't that they couldn't. And sometimes we like to hide behind saying, I can't. And if we would just flip it and say, I won't. Really what they were saying, it was a choice of their will of saying, not I can't believe, but I won't. I'm choosing to not believe. You always have a choice of whether you will believe or you won't. So when God tells us something, what is our response going to be? Just what you've said. So we see in um, Numbers 14, 24, what did it say about Caleb? That he followed him fully. That means all the way. And Deuteronomy 1, 35 through 36 says this, Surely not one of these men of this evil generation see that good land of which I swore to give to your fathers, except... Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he shall see it. And to him and his children, I am giving the land on which he walked because he wholly followed the Lord. So what do we see? He fully followed him. This passage of scripture says he wholly followed him. So what do we know? This is the opposite of drawing back. Fear wants to get you to draw back and to quit. But faith is bold. Faith is vocal. Faith is all in and all the way. Okay. So we see some of them could not enter except Joshua and Caleb. I think of this verse when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith in the earth? So this tells us that faith is not everywhere. Faith isn't this common thing that's all over the place. And we kind of toss around the faith word a lot. 
But will he find faith on the earth? Will he find faith with you? That means it's not everywhere because if it was everywhere, it'd be easy for him to find. So if you're going to have a different outcome than most people, you're going to have to have a different spirit, a different mentality. You're going to have to talk differently. You're going to have to believe differently. You're going to have to learn to live and walk by faith, which is radically different than most. This goes back to what I was talking about. I am not ashamed of the gospel. You cannot be ashamed to believe differently, to speak differently, to have a different mentality. You can't let the fear of men ruin that and take it away. So what did Joshua and Caleb overcome that the rest did not? Number one, their own temptation to fear and to not believe. They overcame that because what did, what did we see in that passage? They saw the exact same picture that the other ten spies saw. And we would be silly to think that when they saw that picture, thoughts did not come to want to tempt them to do what the other ten spies did. And I'm sure at that moment when they were looking at everything, it wasn't like they were just going, yeah, guys, we can do it. The 10 spies were probably going, oh, my gosh, do you see that? And, oh, my goodness, look at this. And, oh, I'm sure there was a lot of talking that was going on before they actually reached Moses and the rest of the camp. So that whole time, Joshua and Caleb had to remind themselves of what God had promised them. And they had to resist the temptation to fear and to not believe. So this is one of the greatest battles that we'll ever face is our own personal dealings with fear and temptation to draw back and to quit. The enemy wants to bombard you with fear, with what you're looking at. But we walk by faith. And if you don't walk by faith, you'll get off course by fear and unbelief. And this isn't just something that you overcome and it happens one time. And actually, what we see with Joshua and Caleb, they didn't come back and say, guys, we can take it and then turn around and go conquer the city. It was 40 years. It was a whole nother generation. So did you know they didn't just believe that day? They had to keep believing the promise of God. Sometimes we look at the story and go, oh, that's so awesome. They believed and it happened. It was years. And we're going to look, but Caleb was still found as strong, if not stronger, than before. So it is a battle every day. And we are surrounded in an environment of fear. So this is why you have to guard your gates. What are your gates? Your eyes your ears, your mouth, what you are listening to, what you are watching, who you're letting be a voice in your life, whether it's a person or internet or YouTube or the news or whatever. Because the enemy will be sure to find a way to try to put fear in front of you. And this isn't to say that even when you're vigilant and guarding, that fear is not going to still come. But why would I open those gates to that? Why would I cause myself more of a battle and more of a temptation? This is also why it's important to come to church with believers and to be strengthened in faith. This is why it's good in your own time to read your Bible, to put on words of faith, teaching things that are going to stir up and strengthen your faith the promises of God. Because when we're surrounded by the promises of God, it makes it easier for us to stand and believe. So, uh, just like we talked about, Joshua and Caleb probably had to throw down some thoughts. So, the same way, we're going to have to throw down those thoughts that try to exalt themselves over what God has promised. 
The second thing that Caleb and Joshua had to overcome is they had to overcome others' fear and unbelief. This is also why it's important who you hang out with. And we talk sometimes about having faith buddies. This is why. You need people who will speak faith. And when they speak faith, that we don't shut it off and get mad and offended. Because what do we see? Caleb and Joshua quieted the people. They said, hey, we're not going to listen to this anymore. So they had to conquer others' fear and unbelief. Or we could say this, fear of man. How many times are you standing and believing, and sometimes fear of man can get you tripped up? What are people going to think if I say this? What are people going to think if I post this? What are people going to think if I declare this or say this in this situation? And fear of man causes us to draw back and to pull back and to quit. So do you think that Joshua and Caleb could probably sense in the camp that there was a little bit different environment than where they were at? (laughs) I probably, I was thinking of this today, they probably sometimes got together and said, hey, do you remember what God promised us? Hey, you remember what God said? like maybe around a campfire, outside of the tent, everyone else is weeping and wailing, but they're having times where they stir themselves up. And Joshua is saying, yeah, remember, Caleb, God came and said, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it. Do you think there was some meditating? Do you think there was some talking amongst each other to stir themselves up in what God told them so that the environment that they were in and surrounded by did not get in them? This is why we have to be feeding on faith and talking faith, not just to ourselves, but to others. Because I guarantee you, they strengthened each other. So, like I said, Joshua and Caleb didn't just have to believe the Lord in that moment, but they had to do it for the next 40 years. There was talk going on of encouraging each other. Hebrews 3, 6 says this, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. So what do we see? Hold fast with confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. So there's a holding fast. And what are we to hold fast? To confidence and hope. And when we're holding on to those, there's rejoicing. And where, where is this supposed to take us? Firm to the end. All the way to the end. Firm to the end. So we are a people who will hold firmly to the end. Say that. I'm holding to the end. Hebrews 3, um, 15 through 19 says, While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that he would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. So like we talked about, it wasn't the giants. It wasn't the problem. It wasn't what they were facing. It was their own unbelief. What keeps us out and what keeps us from not entering is unbelief. And do you think that Joshua and Caleb over those 40 years had a temptation to harden their hearts? Do we have temptation to harden our hearts? Yes. And that temptation is there to get us to draw back and to let go. And how many of you know there is something to maintaining faith? This is what we see Joshua and Caleb did. They maintained their faith to the end. 
it doesn't always just happen overnight. The promises of God don't just happen like boom. Don't grow weary in well-doing. Faith and patience inherit the promise. So you have to maintain your faith in the midst of persecution, whether it's from thoughts like we talked about that come to you or from others. Hebrews 4, 6 says, Since therefore it remains that some must enter, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience or unbelief. And unbelief here simply means unpersuadable. That they entered, they didn't enter in because they were unpersuadable. Another example of what we see as unpersuadable and where is Thomas when he's a disciple of Jesus. This is after Jesus dies and is risen. And he comes back and they said, he's alive. And he said, I won't believe it unless I can see him and I can touch him. What was it? It's just what we talked about. I have to have all the reason. I have to have the tangible. I have to know and see in front of me before I'm going to believe. But how many of you know that's not how we're led? And that's not how we're to believe. We're to believe because he said so. So how did Joshua and Caleb not quit? How did they maintain maintain faith that didn't quit? Number one, they did not by not looking at the scene or the passage of time. How many of you know we can draw back and we can quit when we look at sometimes the passage of time? I've been standing for this long, and why hasn't this happened yet? I've heard this word of the Lord or this prophecy, and I'm still not seeing it. The passage of time gets you to do what? To unbelieve, to draw back, and to quit on the promise. But how many of you know quitting isn't final? I've quit lots of times on stuff. But guess how quick it is to get right back up on your faith? You can get right back up. So they didn't look at what was seen or the passage of time. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says this, So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says this, for we walk by faith, not by sight. So we don't look at passage of time to determine if God is working. We don't look at what we see or how someone is or isn't acting or what is or isn't in our bank account or what is or isn't whatever it might be. We look at what his word says and that promise, and that's where we maintain our faith. We fix our eyes on that. Hebrews 12, 2 says this, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So we see again, fix our eyes on Jesus. And what do we know? Jesus is the word. So when we fix our eyes on the word, we're fixing our eyes on him. Number two, how did Joshua and Caleb not quit? They had to keep looking at what God told them. We talked about this, Joshua 1.8. What did he say? This book of the law shall not depart of your, out of your mouth. How many times do we see in that passage where it says, be of good courage, be of good courage? Do you think Joshua was meditating on this? Be bold, be courageous. God told them that they would inherit the land along with their children. They didn't look where, sorry, they didn't look where they were going. They didn't look at where they were. They looked at where they were going. This is key. If we just look at all of the circumstances and everything we're in instead of the promise, and how many of you know the promise always paints a picture It causes you to have hope. It causes joy. It causes, but if I'm just looking at everything right here instead of what God's promised and where I'm going and where he's bringing me to. Okay, let's look at um, 
this is the, the last um, verse here. We'll go here. Joshua 14, 6 through 15. And I wanted to read this because this is after the 40 years. And this is when they conquered the land and they're giving out the inheritance of the land. It says, then the sons of Judah approached, and this is the BSB, so I don't know if we have that, so, um, but I love how this was wrote. It says, then the sons of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, you know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, at Kadesh Barnea about you and me. So this is their coming. Sons of Judah came to him, and now it's Joshua and Caleb here. So Caleb is speaking up and saying, hey, you remember, right? You remember 40 years ago. You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, about you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought back to him an honest report. Although my brothers who went with me made the hearts of the people melt with fear, I remain loyal to the Lord my God. So this is his testimony. And what's amazing is he's still believing. I remained loyal to the Lord my God. On that day, Moses swore to me, saying, Surely the land on which you have set foot will be an inheritance to you and your children forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. Now behold, as the Lord promised, he has, he has kept me alive these 45 years since he spoke the word, this word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness. So here I am today. Can you just see it? This isn't a guy that's like, this is like a guy that's as bold, if not bolder than he was 45 years ago. And he's older, but he's still like dogmatic. I just love this. So he has kept me alive these 45 years since he spoke the word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness. So here am I today, 85 years old, still as strong today as I was the day Moses sent me out. As my strength was then, so it is now for war, for going out and for coming in. Now, therefore, give me this hill country that the Lord promised me on that day. For you yourself heard then that the Anakim were there with great and fortified cities. Perhaps with the Lord's help, I will drive them out as the Lord has spoken. Then Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. Therefore, Hebron belongs to Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, as an inheritance to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord, the God of Israel. Don't you love that? I, I just love this because this is a picture of all the way to the end. And this is a picture of Caleb wasn't weak after 40 to 45 years. He wasn't barely squeaking by. And like crossing the finish line like, okay, can I have my inheritance? I finally made it. He was strong in faith. He said, I'm as strong now as I was then. God kept me. He promised me, give me my inheritance. <laughs> that was his testimony. And that is our testimony. All the way to the end. I'm all in and all the way to the end. I'm not quitting. I'm not weakening in faith. There's promises that he's promised us individually and corporately, and we will see them. You will see them. We're a body of believers who's strong in faith, strong in the word, strong in believing. And just like Joshua and Caleb, they had to remind themselves and they had to remind each other. So this is so important, not just reminding ourselves, but reminding each other. You know, it could have been really easy for Joshua and Caleb to go to each other and talk about everything that they saw and how the camp was and can you believe what's going on and they want to kill us and they want to do this and weaken their faith. They didn't talk the problem. They kept themselves up on the answer of what God had promised them. And this is what caused them to maintain their faith and to finish and to inherit so let's stand up tonight.
And you know, there's something about when you are in faith, what does it say? I believe, therefore I speak. There is a speaking part to faith as well. And how many of you know Joshua and Caleb didn't just remain silent. They spoke. They quieted the people and they spoke out what God said. And you know what? That was probably as much for the people as it was for them, for them to hear again what God said. You have to hear again what has God said. What are his promises to you? And so tonight I just heard and God's just been stirring me up again on promises that I've quit on. I've let go on because of looking at passage of time or naturally things that I see that causes me to what? Back off, not be bold in faith. The righteous are as bold as a lion. And you know what the lion does? He roars. And they say it can be heard up miles away. And what's he doing? He's marking out his territory, but he's also letting any one there know, hey, guess who's here? And you know what? You have to mark your territory to let the enemy know, hey, guess who's here? And when you're quiet, when you're quiet, you lose territory. But it's time for us to be bold and to advance. A lion's not looking and going, oh my gosh, you see all that? Like he, he's bold because he knows I'm the top here. I rule around here. Guess what? You've been called to rule and to reign. You're seated far above. So use your voice to declare and to take tor- territory and to advance. And it doesn't just come like we talked about. It doesn't just come because God's going to drop it on you. It comes because you respond in faith. And responding in faith is standing up when you've been sitting down. It's standing up. It's standing up. It's using your voice to declare his promises and to move forward. Because the enemy wants you to get to just stand there and to look at everything and to assess it. And then to make decisions off of what you see and how you feel. And then you look and there's no advancing taking place. As a matter of fact, retreat. (laughs) We're not retreating. We're going forward in faith. Amen. So let's just close our eyes tonight and lift your hands. And say this, I'm advancing in faith. I'm using my voice to increase my territory. Devil, you take your hands off in the name of Jesus. I'm all in and I'm going all the way. Steadfast in faith, immovable, unshakable, and I will inherit all of the promises that God has given me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That should be, you should be shouting and joyful because you're looking at the promise. And when you're looking at the promise and when you know the promiser is one who calls himself faithful, who's right with you all the time. You know what's amazing is they talked about actually how the spies came back and reported that they're, we're like grasshoppers and they're big and they're, and they, those nations were afraid. All of those years, those nations talked about and were afraid of the God of the children of Israel. But they had so convinced themselves that we're tiny, we're nothing. You're not tiny and you're not nothing. You're mighty in God. And you can do all things who strengthens you. And you can stand strong in faith and know that the enemy is afraid of you. And the only territory he's taking is what you let him take. But no more. Because we're strong in faith and we're inheriting everything. And we're doing everything that he calls us to do. And we're strong, just like Caleb. 40 years from now... We're strong. 
We don't weaken in faith. No passage of time weakens us. Amen. All right. Well, we love you all. Have a great night. And we will see you Sunday.